uh, uh, today's guy we're going to talk about uh, um, the way of the way of the ice cube and uh, I've got to give credit to uh, uh, Joko Beck she's one of my seminal teachers in sitting as was Suzuki Roshi and then Thomas Keating would be the third these three people a mix of different instruction, but they really have given me a, a really firm foundation for sitting. And, uh, and I, I really am going to, it's my intention to stress that for the uh, next month or so as we get, it doesn't matter if you're political or apolitical, it doesn't matter if you Republican or Democrat, uncommitted. Uh, we're in this, uh, in this country when you're in an election season. You're, you, you can't get out of it. I mean, there's a vibration that's different and unsettling sometimes, uh, and uh, sort of even like tornado or hurricane levels at some points. And so I want really to uh, go back to the basics uh, with the group and so that you will be able to go through this uh, uh, season with a uh, stronger meditation, uh, practice one that's more stable. Actually, I'm going to try to turn you all into fundamentalists in the fundamental meaning of the word. Fundament is really the earth. And so, you know, you would sit on the earth. That was really what it meant to be a fundamentalist. Uh, the, the sky is the firmament. So fundament and firmament. So I really want to get you really grounded in a meditation practice. So that's, that's going to be the subject of all my talks really for the next month or so. Then we'll go into, we'll go into super quantum gear as we get closer to the election. We got trials, we got all this stuff here. So this is, uh, and the, this particular uh, uh, talk, uh, just gonna be a poem. Uh, we'll, I, we'll have a, two really bits of wisdom, one before and one after and then the poem in between, sort of classic Oreo setup. Dave brought me a pack of mint Oreos yesterday and reminded me of that as I was pulling this together. The cream filling is gonna be the poem and hopefully we'll do a, a shorter so we'll have a little longer time to sit and a longer time to talk. Well, okay, uh, so the first bit, of, these two bits of wisdom are like, uh, they're on either side of the world. They come from different cultures, but it's the same wisdom. So the first one's from uh, Merton, uh, Kentucky boy, boy, was just down the road for 27 years here. And this is really, I think this is really gonna be helpful. He said, uh, all we need to experience, this is a classic Merton sentence, 10 words, um, but you can hang your hat on this, I have. He says, all we need to experience is what we already possess. It's a beautiful sentence. All we need to experience is what we already possess. Now, when I first read that, I had no idea what he was talking about. And, uh, you know, it's just too unbelievable to believe. All we need to experience is what we already possess. And then we'll come in with uh, a bit of wisdom from Polynesia at the end. But here's the poem. It's called The Way of the Ice Cube. And, I first had this metaphor from uh, reading uh, talks by Joko Beck. Joko was a woman who didn't get into uh, Zen practice until she was like in her late forties. Sometimes she's called the grandmother of Zen. She taught until she was uh, in her nineties. And I really recommend her book, uh, uh, Everyday Zen. It's the first of her three books. Uh, and they're just her talking to people who are in a sitting, sitting session, in other words, intensive sitting retreats. They're really good. Yeah. And so I, I got the image of the ice cube from, from her. So, but the poem, uh, uh, it just was finished this morning. <laughs> Here it is. Um, the Way of the Ice Cube, Nine Bows to Charlotte Choco Beck. Human beings who are being run by their egos are like ice cubes. Human beings who are being run by their egos are like ice cubes. To practice uh, ourselves, to protect ourselves, we freeze. 
as hard as we can and hope that when we collide with another ice cube, they will shatter before we do. To protect ourselves, we freeze as hard as we can and hope that when we collide with another ice cube, they will shatter before we do. We freeze because we are afraid. We are afraid because we think we're separate. Why did mom kick me out? How did I become just a lonely subject in a cold, dark world of objects? The witness, the awareness of our own activity is the sun. Witness, the awareness of our own activity is the sun. But as long as our awareness is turned outward towards what the other ice cubes are doing, the witness can't appear, even though it's always present. If we're lucky, often after years of knocking around in the ice cube game, we begin to wonder if just maybe all those other damn ice cubes aren't what's causing my suffering. Maybe I have to look at myself and presto, the witness appears. And when the witness appears, little darling, here comes the sun. When your ice cube begins to sweat and get mushy, expect fear. Expect lots of bitching, complaining, and resistance and tears. But if your witness strengthens, your ice cube becomes a puddle. The ice cube is the main source of suffering as a person ages. A puddle is a ripe human being whose life is not frozen, but flows. Your puddle is a magnet for other ice cubes who want to melt. A non-dual relationship is when two ice cubes melt into one puddle. You're invited to join the big waltz. You are invited to join the big waltz. Ice cubes, puddles, rivers, sea. Yeah, that'll be printed tomorrow morning at 4 a.m. Eastern time, if you can't wait. <laughs> but uh, let me just tease out a couple things and then we'll go to the uh, Polynesian wisdom. It's exactly what Merton saw a half hour down the road here. Human beings who are being run around by their, were run by their egos are like ice cubes. Like ice cubes, metaphor, metaphor. But you know, just, some people for their whole lives are run by this little voice in the head. You know, if you, you know, if you actually spoke the words that you're hearing in your head to anybody else, you wouldn't have many friends. You really wouldn't. Uh, to protect ourselves, we freeze as hard as we can and hope that we will, when we collide with another ice cubes, because there's billions of them out there, they will shatter before we do. We freeze because we're afraid. We're afraid because we think we're separate. I mean, why did mom kick me out? How, do I how did I become a lonely subject in a cold, dark world of objects? The witness, which is the awareness of our own activity, is like the sun. But as long as your awareness is turned outward towards uh, all the other uh, uh, ice cubes and, and what they're doing, as long as you turn your awareness outward, the witness can't appear even though it's always present. Now, this was the genius of the Buddha because uh, his experience, he, he was the first one to really do this that I'm aware of. He just said, maybe, you know, all, you know, we keep, we keep looking at all these objects that keep moving and we want to rearrange them so that my life is just perfect and totally happy all the time. And they just keep moving or doing things that we don't like. And, uh, so he said, maybe, just maybe suffering, because that's when he went to the forest, when he learned that, uh, that people, people suffer, get ill, die, and he didn't know any of that, supposedly. He was sheltered by, in, the, in the castle. 
when he learned that, he said, uh, he went out to figure out a way to stop suffering for everybody in the world, but he had to make that turn. And every contemplative makes a 180 at some point. Like for, we're here in Bardstown. If you wanted to go to Louisville, you walk north, but if you start walking south, you don't say, hey, turn around. You could make it eventually if you want to go 24,000 miles, but you know, turn around. That's the essence of a meditative, when meditation takes over, you turn to where you're looking for the answers, where you're looking for the happiness, where you're looking ultimately for love and peace and joy, because you might not find it out there amongst the billions of ice cubes out there. We're just doing the same thing you are. So the witness, which is awareness, turns towards uh, uh, yourself. Uh, but as long as you're looking out there, uh, the witness can't appear, even though it's always present. And if you're lucky, after years of knocking around in the ice cube game, which we've all done, we begin to wonder, if you're lucky, you begin to wonder, well, maybe it's just not all those damn ice cubes. It's just not my boss, or it's just not my wife, or my, my husband, or my relatives, what a family, you know, all that stuff, all that stuff. And you just say, well, maybe me, maybe, you know, and so you do this. If, if this is where you're committing to having a contemplative practice, when you decide, maybe I really ought to look at myself. Say, boom, that's when the, the presto, the witness appears. It's just awareness, but a certain form of awareness where you're looking inside. That was the Buddha's great invention. They invented the monastery. So give up your day job. So we can all go here and we can just do this practice and then go out and beg food at lunchtime. Low, you know, there was no, you know, you just, you know, a bunch of guys, you know, at first, a bunch of guys, you know, they eventually let the women in on the game. Uh, but, uh, it, you know, you just lower your overhead. You just beg your lunch at, uh, at uh, noon uh, with a begging bowl. And then the rest of the time you can sit and look inside. No, I didn't have any monasteries before the Buddha. Yeah. And when the witness does appear, here comes the sun. When your ice cube begins to sweat and get mushy, you put an ice cube in the sun, uh, it'll do that. Uh, when that happens, you personally expect fear. Fear is a good sign. You know, when you start in this game, fear is a good sign because it, it, you're starting to melt. And then uh, expect lots of bitching and complaining and resistance and tears as it really gets mushy. Things, your, your own plans fall apart, you say. But if your witness strengthens, which is the whole idea of a daily practice, when your witness strengthens, uh, your ice cube becomes a puddle. The ice cube is the main source of suffering as a person ages. This is, you know, we have a few younger uh, folks in here, but you know, we're all aging even if you're 20. You know, I knew a guy who died at 11. He was actually in the second half of life just his, his disease pushed him into that. So, but you know, we're a more graying community here. Uh, and you know, but most of the suffering is not the aches and pains we all talk about. It's really um, uh, the fact that uh, we're still in the ice cube mode. We're not puddles yet. A puddle is a ripe human being whose life it's not frozen, it flows. You're, that's the third beatitude when we ever get to the beatitudes in Aramaic. That's what the third beatitude is about. Who, who knows? <laughs> you're, uh, but when you become more puddle-like, uh, there's a kind of magnetic pull and it pulls in other ice cubes. If you wanna know what to do with your, your life, become a puddle. And all of a sudden, people start seeking you out. We had like 30, we had 28 people in the Zendo yesterday doing the final uh, sit, which was a chant. We chanted the Omani Pema uh, it was It was wild. It was great. It was great. Uh, this is the first annual gathering of hearts here. And uh, we'll, we'll try to do it every year because it was just too much fun not to do every year. Uh, your puddle's a magnet for other ice cubes. If you did nothing else, do this work and people will come. And then, you know, put an ice cube in a puddle, 
And then uh, this line was one of the last ones that come out as I was working on this bone this morning. A non-dual relationship. People were, all, were asking me, what's not to mean uh, up on my normal stand? Non-dual. A uh, non-dual relationship is when two ice cubes melt into one puddle. It's a beautiful image. Came out of the void for me. And then now just reframe the whole thing. You know, I'm mixing metaphors all over the place, but so did Jesus. Uh, you're invited to join the big waltz. I remember learning how to waltz when I was in junior high. The nuns made us dance with the girls, you know. And so, you know, this, this four step thing, you know, dun, 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 waltz, waltz time, four, four time. And really, that's the mandala we've been working with. It's got those four points. And your human mandala, uh, ice cubes, puddles, rivers, sea. That's the flow of it. All rivers run to the sea. Yeah. Yeah, that's the dance. It's not just a big dance. It's a big waltz. Big waltz. So you're invited. So that's the poem. And that'll be uh, in the mailing tomorrow morning if you want to. Uh, if there's something that you thought was worth looking at. Uh, good, we're shorter today. Something Susan taught me last week. Shorter is better. Uh, now, this is kind of, this This is a segue to our sitting thing, but this is Polynesian wisdom. Uh, it's as short as Merton's and just to the point. In Polynesian wisdom, they said, we're all fishing for minnows standing on the back of a whale. We're all fishing for minnows standing on the back of a whale. What an image. That would be there, you know, that's what they experienced there. But it's the same thing that Merton said. Same, same message. All we need to experience is what we already possess. And if you don't really understand that, it doesn't get through to you that if we possess it, it's in here already. It's the hardest thing for for anybody to expect to believe that uh, everything you need's in here. That doesn't mean you don't need food or shelter. Or no, yeah, but what you really long for, or what is it really key that unlocks the uh, love and the joy and the peace? It's in here. It's got to be found in here. Jail's great metaphor of an archaeological dig, and it's a slow process. It's in here, but we can't reach it because it's covered with all this, all this sediment, which is thoughts and habits and beliefs and traumas. You know, you had to take your time to go through that, but eventually you'll find what you're looking for. And the contemplative practices and all the traditions say what you're looking for, you already possess it. You know, Jesus had all these metaphors, right? Treasure hidden in the field, uh, you know. Uh, the lost coin in the house. He, he just kept coming back to the same image. He said, don't have to go to the temple. The kingdom is within you. Who believed that? Who believes that now? Yeah, but these, these are the guys. These are the, these are the guys, the Buddha, the, Jesus. All mystics know that. We're all fishing for minnows, standing on the back of a whale. It's a great image. So what are you, what are you fishing for? Well, when you go to meditation, yesterday we chanted, uh, and we'll, we'll listen to the chant today. Uh, it'll, it'll be a little different, but it's still pointing to the same way. The chant just keeps repeating the same uh, four words over and over. It's almost like a homing device. Om, mani, pema, hum. Om, mani, pema, hum. Hail the jewel in the lotus, exclamation point. That's what the hung is. But you know, there, there, there's a jewel hidden in the lotus. You know, the jewel is compassion. The lotus is wisdom. That's, that's the metaphors from the Tibetan point of view. Other people talk about the true self or, or your true nature or the essence, different words for different traditions. But that's the whale, you see. We're standing on the back of the whale. We're right here and we don't even know it. We're fishing for minnows. We want to be successful. We want everybody to like us. I certainly do. That ego part that's still around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so now when we go fishing here, uh, you don't really you can throw the rod away. We're just sitting. We're going to sit still and experience, as Merton says. We, you know, we all 
you know, all we need to experience, not think about. So the big, what's covering all this? Thoughts, a lot of thoughts. Most of them aren't too friendly, if you think about it. And so what we'll be working on is um, learning how to bring yourself back to something more real, the breath, the body. And so it's a lot of back and forth. It's a lot of back and forth, you know? Well, so the chant is, brings you into the body and then just rest there, just rest there until the next thought. Uh, we're gonna work on, on what to do with those thoughts, but from the, in the beginning, just have the image that you're, you're, you're experiencing reality, you're eating the meal, incredible Italian food, best Italian restaurant you've ever been in. You're there, it's all there. You can smell it, you can eat it. And then next minute, you're outside the restaurant reading the menu. Where would you rather be? You come back in the restaurant, okay? Yeah. Uh, come back in, There's <laughs> come back in. You know, so you'll find yourself reading the menu. It might not be too good, you know? Uh, you're comparing yourself to somebody else, you're judging, you're planning, you're rehearsing, all those things we do. You know, I'm going to help you to try to find your four horsemen of the apocalypse and a, a further thing if you haven't found them already. I know what mine are. And then there's some, there's some stuff I have no idea what I'm doing out here, outside the restaurant. And I just, you know, I just, I'm thinking something, but I don't even know what it is. Come back in. And... That, um, that just simple practice is what we're doing here. And that will, over the time, turn you into a puddle. It'll melt the cube, guaranteed, guaranteed. So let, let's move into meditation mode and we can uh, stop the talk and go into the silence. <laughs> 